thank you all so much for joining us here today. My name is Holly Mazaka, and I am the president of Bartlett Wealth Management. It is my joy to bring together these three incredible women. This uh, has been a bit of a brainchild of mine ever since I read Marianne Lewis's book, Both and Thinking. And it got me thinking about all the paradox that goes on in our life and how do you hold two competing ideas and the tension between those ideas together and come up with creative solutions about how you can move forward. And as a female leader, there's a lot of these tensions that I feel in my own life. And I reached out to Marianne, who, in addition to being the wonderful researcher and author that she is, also has just a wee little day job of running the business school, the Lindner College of Business at the University of Cincinnati as the dean of the School of Business. And I said, this is just such a fascinating concept. How do we bring this to more people to really take the ideas off the page and bring it to life in a conversation. And as we started discussing it, we were actually at an event for small businesses and Mary Miller, who was the 30 year CEO of Jancoa and has just recently transitioned that business to the ownership and leadership of her next generation, which includes her daughter and other family members. We were chatting together and Mary uh, Mary said, this is just something that I've been thinking a lot more about as I rewire to what comes next and how do you hold the tensions together and how do you think about what this transition means? Um, so I said, well, let's do it with Mary Ann. And then uh, shortly thereafter, Kelly and I were in a leadership group together and Kelly Kolar is the founder and president of Kolar Design and has done some amazing work with Bartlett and we've partnered together on other projects. And um, Kelly, who's also an avid supporter of UC and a, a graduate of the DAP uh, program at, at UC and still very engaged said, I'm dealing with these things too. Um, and we were just joking before we hopped on here that Kelly said, I want to be Mary when I grow up. And I said, I want to be Kelly when I grow up. And Mary and said, I want to be all of you. So today we're here to just have a really fun conversation and explore what this paradox means for all of us. And how do we use the concepts out of uh, Marianne's book to really help us solve these, to help us and also understand that not everything can be solved, right? Like if we if we took all the paradox out of life, like what fun would it be? We'd probably go find more problems knowing the four of us on this call today. So how do we navigate them and use them to really propel us forward? Uh, so as we get into this, uh, Maggie has just shared down in the chat box a link to the Paradox Mindset Inventory. And this is a resource that Marianne and her co-author, Wendy Smith, developed um, that they've been so nice to allow our group here today to uh, utilize during today's presentation and beyond. So this arrived in your inboxes this morning. Again, it's down in that chat window too, if you um, would like to access that. And, and we'll work through that as we get into today's presentation. So we encourage you to follow along with that, maybe take some notes on there and fill out your own inventory as Marianne breaks down these different parts of us. So to kick us off, I am going to zoom out a little bit and pull in Marianne Lewis here and ask you, Marianne, to really share with us about the impetus for the Both And Thinking book uh, that you co-authored with Wendy and what really made you all want to start exploring this topic. Well, thank you, Holly. And it's such a pleasure to be with everybody today. This book was really 25 years in the making. And it started with early research, of first with me and then later with Wendy, um, at very much a strategy organizational level. So I'll give you kind of the, the flavor, right? I was studying automation in manufacturing. And these debates about whether automation was about control or flexibility. And then I started studying innovation. And I was getting into these issues of, is it about today making the mo more of what we have now or this radical innovation which is tomorrow and and you can and basically as i started going down this path 
it became very clear to me that this is these patterns actually existed in my life. They existed in leadership. That we we live and swim in these tensions that present themselves to us as dilemmas, right? Do I focus on myself or others? Do I how do I manage work or, and life, right? All of these pieces. Um, and the more we started studying this, the more we found that there was a, a notable difference in the mindset and practices of people who do it well. And the way I we, we came to frame this is around the notion of paradox. So if if you if I if I may, I'll step back one one and just share with you kind of an early study I found that I hope can bring this to life. This fellow by the name of Albert Rothenberg was studying creative geniuses. This was Mozart and Einstein and uh, Virginia Woolf and a host, right? And what he found is that these people embraced what most of us would probably kind of shy away from, right? That Mozart was looking at the juxtaposition of light of, of harmony and discord. And Picasso was looking at uh, dark and light. And Einstein was, you know, are things in motion or at rest or particles or waves, right? You see what I'm doing? And what he found is this idea of paradoxical thinking. And you see it now in this mindset inventory that is a lot of work that has gone to kind of operationalizing, which basically tur means turning something into a measure, work by Rothenberg and a lot of other people's. Because what creative geniuses do, and you do not have to be a genius to do it, is they lean into the tensions. They see that creative friction, right? Think about friction. It's, it creates a diamond, right? It, it's, a, you know, in a bow when you're playing the violin, it's friction. It's, right, you could, but they see it as opportunity for creativity, for learning, for growth. But the idea also of paradox is that it's more like a yin yang. And so I always do that with my hands because if you can picture in your mind a yin yang, the light and the dark, they they actually create a whole together. You need both sides. Yes, they're opposites. You can feel the tug of war and they're connected, which Tali, to your point, means they don't really go away. You might make a decision today between work and life, taking care of yourself or others efficiencies and innovation. You will have to make it again tomorrow. So the paradox inventory was really our putting it to paper what we found differentiates people who work well in the tension and those who really get defensive and struggle. And I think one last thing to say about that is we've now have it, we've set, you've used it for thousands of people, multiple languages. We were, Wendy and I were just on a call with Japan yesterday. And what's powerful to us, and we're going to keep testing it, and I always will take criticisms and feedback, is that in our studies, we've analyzed individuals and their supervisors. What we found is the more people experience tensions, which is that first part, right? The, the, the more you feel like you're in the tug of war, the more positively powerful the mindset becomes. So the supervisors telling us the people who have a higher paradox mindset are more productive, higher performers. They are more creative. This is according to the supervisors. And according to the people themselves, they are more satisfied. That is a really powerful triumvirate, performance, creativity, and satisfaction. And we believe it can be learned. There's practice involved. So I, I get excited and I can say more, but I, I want to kind of give you that flavor because that's really what took me down this path is seeing there is a difference in how you can embrace or defend yourself from these tensions that we all live in every day. Marianne, thank you for that background and for alluding to this idea that this is something that we don't have to come into it with a fixed mindset around, that this can be a growth mindset where we can learn to do more of that. And I definitely want to jump into that um, further into our webinar. I uh, also want to encourage our guests here today to utilize the Q&A functionality down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please add those throughout the conversation. Uh, Maggie Spataro will be organizing 
asking those and we'll jump in with some questions along the way and we'll leave plenty of time at the end. And this is certainly one that we have to sort of practice and work with in order to really bring it to life. So um, I think you also brought up a really good point, Marianne, just on this idea of how tensions shift over time. And sometimes they're really strong one way or really strong the other way, uh, but they never really go away. We never really totally solve them at any one point in time. Uh, I want to use that as a jumping off point here to really bring in Mary and Kelly into our conversation uh, that you are both in different points of uh, your careers. Mary, as I said earlier, has uh, been the CEO of Jancoa for 30 years and has recently rewired into the next phase. And Kelly is still very much uh, living the day-to-day -day dream of um, managing the Kolar business. Um, so I'd love to hear from you, Mary, what came to mind for you when you were reading the book, when you were exploring this in your own life, what paradoxes really stood out to you? Mute. Every experience in my life that had intense emotion connected to it was a paradox. And I felt like I've been through that a lot. Personally, I was a single mom with three kids for many years before I met Tony. Tony and I have been married 32 years. We worked together for 30 years. So there was all kinds of tensions and paradox with the mixed family, blended family, and then owning this business and moving from 65 employees to today, there's over 600 employees of Jancoa, all in the greater Cincinnati area. And it's a 24-7 business. It's commercial janitorial. And, you know, the COVID helped a lot with this business. <laughs> you know, our team members, for the first time, were told they were essential. There was so many different tensions and paradoxes to take care of our people, our customers, the community. I mean, there was just all kinds of bits of it. But one of the biggest things that stuck out to me, it, it just made my life make sense because I'm like, oh, that's what that was, you know, and that that helped me a lot. It just I felt much freer after listening. I actually listened to the book and found it was fascinating. One of the biggest things that ever happened to us, and I use it often in my speaking and coaching, is our biggest obstacles are our biggest opportunities, and that paradox can confuse people all the time because they either only see the good of what could be or the negative of what is. And at a time when early, it was around 95, Tony and I were really focusing on trying to build this business that at the time had 65 part-time employees and I hired a consultant. He fired us on the second day of a five-day contract. He said he couldn't help us. He, you know, the, the plan was because Tony and I were going to make this, this mom and pop shop, something that was successful that maybe one day somebody might want to buy because that's the entrepreneurial dream. Right. So I, I went to the industry. I found this guy. Bob was amazing. Great reputation. Five days, first night, him and Tony went out to the biggest building we had that we really wanted to start with. The next day he showed back up in my office for our meeting with his suitcase in hand. He said, I, I can't help you. You have a people problem. And it wasn't that our people were the problem. We didn't have enough people, which is standard in our industry and has been for years. Just today, a lot of you are feeling my pain because <laughs> there's a lot of people dealing with what we've always had in the janitorial industry is high turnover, four to hundred percent annual is the average in our business. But we, we created a program. We embraced that paradox and the tensions and changed the questions. And I think that's one of the biggest things And Marianne talks about in the book. It's about the questions you ask. And if you're not getting any kind of feeling to move forward and you still feel stuck, they're the wrong questions. Like for me, I, I started with very simple questions about why would they want to work for us? What could we do to create an environment that people would want to be part of our industry? At the time, there was 104 other cleaning companies. If somebody wanted to work in our industry, which many do that are in transition, that are working through some obstacles in their life, why choose us? 
How could we help them be more successful? And then how can we get them to want to stay for three to five years to get a return on that investment? And that led to creating the dream engineer and really changing the quality of life for our team members. You know, it wasn't just about taking care of the customer anymore. It created a, a new balance and view of business of taking care of our team members who took care of our customers. And it freed me up to be involved in the community which really made Jancoa a, a community business because of the way we work and all aspects of that. And the, the paradox and the tensions shifted from time to time, but knowing that's what it was. But I think I also have the benefit of being a, a client and a coach in a program called Strategic Coach, where every quarter, every 90 days, I go away for eight hours to pause reflect over the past 90 days and plan the next 90 days. Because one of the obstacles, tensions that every human being deals with, is we don't stop. We don't stop to think and reflect and plan. We just keep going and thinking tomorrow's going to be different. That's such a good point. And one that I am guilty of myself as I looked back through my notes and I have a very annotated copy of the book in front of me here. <laughs> Um, I've gone back and I've re-looked at some of these items that have come up and, and you're right, Mary, one of the things that I wrote down here is how do I reframe the question? And I think that's such a, a great point and living in this idea of our greatest challenges, our greatest obstacles are also our greatest opportunities. I love that. That's something really fantastic. And I want to um, put a pin also in the dream engineer. would love to come back and learn more about that and how this idea of paradox has helped you really build that as well. So um, Kelly, let's jump over to you. What parts of this idea of the both and thinking stood out to you? So, you know, obviously I'm trained, you know, as a designer, that's, you know, my graduation from DAP, as you know, so I'm always leading in, you know, vision casting the next piece. And my favorite thing about the book was it just showed me how insanely creative being an entrepreneur is and how we need to embrace every day this yes and thinking. Design by itself is actually about paradox thinking. We are trained in this, in, in design school, as well as in design thinking. So we practice a lot of empathy-based work here, as well as using, um, you know, how might we questions. When we see a tension point, we actually know by the sign of a tension point that we must dig in and really continue to question and build our creativity around solving the problem. And it's always a paradoxal situation. So usually I'm actually looking on the horizon for where there is that conflict because that's therein lies the solution. Mary said a little bit differently about the opportunity. And for us, any design solution, whether I'm designing my own company or like Mary did with hers, or I'm actually designing a physical environment, you know, the UC Main Street, you know, vision for the future, you know, or a corporate headquarters for Potter and Gamble. It's always about understanding the next nexus and the discovery process that we go through is actually trained and embedded in us to use this paradoxal thinking as a part of our process. So when I scored out on the sheet, for me, the big takeaway was, wow, I didn't realize how much designing my life and designing our business and obviously the way that I've been trained and, and you know, to, to create something from nothing as an entrepreneur plays into this Yes, and thinking 100%, like end to end, soup to nuts. I was like, oh, there's that, Jeff. Kind of like Mary said earlier, like, oh, I wish I'd had this book 30 years ago. <laughs> we probably would have been a lot farther along in our thinking. Uh, so I think that's for me, this is just unbelievable, you know, as we go through any solution that we're trying to create in our personal lives or our professional lives or for our clients, it's all about evaluating the A and the B. And how do you end up? finding the solution. And it's always in the scene, always in the scene, always in the scene. I mean, I, you know, we actually give entire talks in our company about finding, you know, some people say God is in the detail and really it's God is in this tension point. That's really where the pure creativity happens. And that's just something that we've believed in, in our company. And that's why we always look for the pain point. We look for the, the conflict, we look for the, you know, the paradoxal 
experience of what's happening. And that's why we're usually brought into the table to create something of the future. Kelly, that was so beautiful and so well said. Tony and I were talking this morning before we all got together for this. And as I did my scoring, I said in re our reflection, and I said, let me run this by you, see if you're on the same, if I'm on, we're on the same page. Yeah. And I said, I don't know how people get through anything in life without faith, because you can't make a decision and know it's going to be 100% correct. You, you gather what you know, and you trust your, what you know in your instinct and have the faith that it's going to work and you move forward. And through every obstacle, I had a, a reporter from a magazine talking to me one time when there was an issue in our industry, and he was trying to get me to say, well, we would have to close business. Hmm. And I said, I know what you're doing, and I'm not going there. That's not an option. I have lots of other options. That's not one. Too many people depend on us. So that, that God and the faith piece for me has been huge. And knowing you look at all the options, if you have to take a pad of sticky notes and write them all down so you can see them, yep. makes it helpful for me. And just have the faith that you're going to make the right decision. You make the decision, then you make it happen. Yeah, so it's really believing in that possibility mm -hmm. of creating the next step, whatever that next step may be for you in your personal life or in your business or in me, what I do, with creating experiences for people the possibility and the, you know, that creativity to lead to that high performance, Marianne, that you talked about. You really have to continue to push yourself to be able to get there. And so I, when I scored out on this thing, by the way, I didn't know about the average score. That was one of the things I was going to talk about. You know, I realized like everything in my whole life is this. So I was, I was on a 5.5 on the scorecard um, because I just realized that that's actually how we do our best work is by having this work by having this process. So I'd love to help validate. And it's something I'm going to, with our teams, you know, Marianne, you know, we would, we want to do a, a book discussion in our team with our creativity and our team. So everybody can understand this is part of the process. It also can be, as you said, very fearful and, you know, intimidating and scary. And some people really don't want to go there, but actually if you're willing to be on the field, building a future, no matter who you are, Holly, you're building, you know, we invest futures for women and finance and financial literacy and wellness and all the great things you're doing for us in our community, you know, for us individually, as well as for collectively, you know, we're all building something new. And this paradoxical thinking is pivotal every, every step of the way. And having that faith in yourself to really take on those risks. And so that whatever that faith for each of us individually is that you, that you find that and you lean into that certainly is, is really powerful. And uh, Kelly, I would love to explore, and this goes back to Marianne, you know, thinking about how this is a really a growth oriented thing. So one thing I know you've talked about is this comes naturally for you and Mary, this comes naturally for you. That's what's really set you up to be fantastic leaders. But how do we help build this in others as we go forward? So Marianne, want to go to you and hear about how your relationship with this has changed over time with these tensions. As you think about the paradox, has there been any shifts in the way that you think about them through your research and through your personal experiences? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question, Holly. I mean, yes, I, I think there's, I think it's on two two dimensions, and, and and this is probably the academic in me as well. But I mean, there's the understanding dimension, right? You got to get a, your head around it cognitively, right? Do I actually understand what is going on here? Um, and then there's the emotional side of it, which is, you know, how it's really triggering my experience in the moment. And the reason I say that, I mean, because I, I actually thought maybe the second one I was going to say practices, but what you do is completely driven by the first two. And something that I find in just the, the, the work that I do with organizations and that we do in classes and with others is the practices help us always come back to reinforcing or questioning the way we're thinking and then helping us find some, what we talk about is the comfort and the discomfort. Because no matter how much I talk about this, and I'm curious where Kelly and Mary, especially Kelly, those comments you just made about how comfortable you are, I don't, st I still don't think it feels necessarily good. I mean, like when I even say the word tension, I like feel it in my chest. Yeah. Like I, I feel this little thing happen. Um, and I, but I actually find that 
I, I don't shy away from it because it feels like adrenaline. It feels like possibility. I think that's because we're tra probably talking with people on this, particularly on the screen right now, who are rating very highly on this. We get something out of it. But I also do think, to your point of how has it changed, is with practice and with understanding how this works and starting to see the benefits, you get more comfortable. And th that's not easy. I, I mean, I'm going to say something a little different here. And it reminds me, so uh, Amy Edmondson wrote the foreword to her book. And if you haven't read Amy's book, I'm a huge fan. She's a wonderful friend. She, her newest book is all on failing. And it's called uh, The Right Kind of Wrong. Okay. So the reason why I say this is important is I, I fervently believe it's about, I'm going to use your words, Kelly, the next step. It's about taking the next step and it may fail, but the real confidence and learning is understanding there is learning in every step. And if feeding back that learning changes again, improves, broadens the way you think and builds new comfort, even in the most challenging situations. And, you know, this is, you know, wisdom does come with age because the more bumps in the road we've all experienced, the more we know we can get up after a really hard bump. And that's where you start to get your, 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 par your paradox mindset inventory score will rise with time. But I think to Mary's point, it takes reflection too. It takes stepping back and realizing it didn't kill me. It made me stronger. Here's where I go next. And starting to fuel that learning cycle that is about growth. So let's dig into the inventory. And I want to start here with the first section, experiencing tensions. And specifically number two stands out for me and probably stands out for all of us at this really busy time of year, this holiday season. Number two says, I often have competing demands that need to be addressed at the same time. And I'm laughing because anyone who knows me knows that this is like pretty much the constant world that I live in. Um, so let's talk about that. Kelly, let's begin with you. How did you score on this question? And what sprang to mind when you think about how you deal with just constant competing demands? So of course, this was one of my ones that was a seven. <laughs> um, it cannot be escaped. <laughs> I cannot. I just cannot. One of the many, right? Yeah, exactly. I think as a, you know, first of all, you know, being a kind of a pioneer in the area that I practice in at this intersection, right, of people, process, and place, and kind of creating something about storytelling in space, which when I started the company you know, 33 years ago, was a really, really new concept. And so in the very beginning, I feel that everything was in conflict. The vision that I had, what I believed, what I wanted to learn, what I wanted to explore, I feel like I kind of failed my way to success. And fortunately, I had a lot of clients that took risks with me along the way, you know, even including, you know, you know, like working with Sensei Children's and I was talking to them about measuring the impact of healing spaces, you know, before and after you know, that was a new concept. And that we, had, we all had to take a risk to hire a PhD to help us study that. So back to this, you know, competing demands, you see the vision, you see what you want, and yet you are where you are. And so there's always this tension with, I'm always five steps ahead. And, you know, sometimes you stumble and you fail. And sometimes if I'm five steps ahead and I'm down the wrong path, you know, you have to come back and say, hey, wait a minute, that was the wrong direction. I got to go back, you know, I, talking this morning about humility um, in leading and being willing to fail. Um, you know, back to Amy's, back to Amy's work that you're talking about, I think failing your way forward is such an important concept. And for me, that's why the competing demands. I try not to let time be my determining factor. I try to measure my competing demands within what matters most and what's most important. And I do not let time become the driving force of my life. I just can't, I, I just can't. Because there's never enough time. Time's the one commodity, you know, we can never get back. So when I think of competing demands, it's always for me about the legacy that I'm trying to create, the 
the thought leadership of my team, the methodology, the knowledge transfer, all of the things that we are trying to teach, um, you know, to the next generation within our own company and the competing demands that I have around that because of, you know, we all have a timeout and, and, and way end to our runway. And so, you know, Mary has done, you know, it's such a heroic job of transitioning successfully her business and scaling it and it's going to live up, you know, beyond her and Tony and all the great, you know, work and fulfilling meaningful um, opportunities that they've created for others in our community. And I think that's a really important piece. And I think when you think of your life, competing demands for your life, remember, it's always about the dash between the birth date and the end date. It's all about that dash. And there's a lot of competing interests inside of that. So I think that for me, that's probably the biggest thing that I see. And that's why I put on the strongly agree. I had to have the highest number on that because I feel like I live that. I've been living that every day ever since I started of trying to see the world and leave it a better place than when I entered it. Love this idea of thinking about not letting time or a false sense of urgency be the primary factor of that, but really reflecting, is this going to be something that builds a legacy? Is this going to be something that someone uh, remembers? And it's the, you know, Maya Angelou quote of Angelou quote of it, people will remember how you make them feel. And as you look forward, how do you balance that out? That's really powerful and helpful for me with little kids and figuring out all the nuances there. So Mary, what about you? What stood out to you on this section? Oh, it just articulated what I, what my life is like. It's always, especially being in, Tony and I are both on our third marriage. So we have a very big blended family, five adult kids, 11 grandkids, and going from being a single mom with three to this blended family and then start working in the family business with lots of clusters of families within the 600 employees. There's always things. And then you've got your customers and the vendors and the industry and the government. I mean, there's always conflicting. I think 6.5 was my average. So I had a lot of sevens. There was only a few that were not. And I, that's why I asked Tony, what am I not seeing here? This, he says, that's it. That's exactly it. And you, when you were talking about being comfort and the discomfort, I think it's a habit. You know, there was a time in my life, it's not currently, but I used to do some running and I ran a half marathon and getting up at 4.30 in the morning, all of a sudden felt normal. <laughs> but as soon as I, I, as soon as I tore my meniscus, that was over. But, you know, that's what happens when we allow ourselves. I had a conversation recently and it reminded me when I was going through this, he does a lot of executive coaching and he was asking me some questions and he says, I'm really fascinated by why people do difficult things on purpose intentionally. I'm like, that's how you get results. <laughs> how do you not choose to do the tough stuff? Because anybody can do the easy stuff. And that's why, you know, as this family business in Cincinnati, we've got 85% market share. We don't ignore the tough stuff or the obstacles. We use those so we can better serve our team members and our customers in the community. And that to me is natural. That's normal to me. Now, 30 years ago, it was not. You know, my life did a huge shift, but the results show that what the difference is and always hearing the story of the moth becoming the, or the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work that gets involved in that. And you can't get the beautiful wings if you don't do the work to, to work through that cocoon, right? But if we stay as human beings in cocoons and try to be safe, you can't achieve things that way. Mm -hmm. And I've been blown away by how much, I mean, I, I love the fact that my daughter is the CEO today. The, there's not a lot of mothers to daughters transitions in family businesses. And her and her husband and my brother-in-law, they really were paying attention. I mean, they saw some things differently. They're putting their spin on some stuff, but they're growing and they're doing amazing because they know the tension is part of it. There's always going to be a paradox when you're a union company, you have to make sure that you can balance that out with the, 
the finances and the for the con being in a contract and still being able to pay more and still have enough money because you can't run out of money. So it's <laughs> it, it's just a constant juggling act. It reminds me of years ago in Holly, I don't know if you would ever have seen this on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> where the guy would balance these plates and he would hop. You remember, don't you, Kelly? I know you do, Marianne, right? He, he would have these steel rods and put a plate on it and get it swirling. So the plate was going and then he would start another one over here and he would, and then go back and get it going. And that's, and then if they stopped, they all, the plates would crash. Well, I didn't have the luxury of letting any plates crash. So I had to build a team to help support, to do the things that I couldn't pay close attention to, delegate smart, not to delegate my thinking, but to delegate the different task. And then that's a different kind of tension and a different kind of paradox. So there's just so many layers of this. It's like Shrek, Marianne. There's so many layers to this onion. <laughs> so yeah, there's lots of more books and opportunity mm -hmm. to, to check into this because it really does make a difference when we embrace that. In my book, Changing Direction, the first chapter is embrace change. Because if you don't embrace it, change isn't going to stop. It's barreling down on us every day. And when we embrace it, then we can be in charge of our choices. Not always in charge of the results, but we're in charge of the choices we make and how we're going to move forward to do that. And not doing anything is a choice. Yeah. And often, an, you know, an active choice and sometimes the one that needs to be made. I love this idea of delegation and the idea that you're not delegating your thinking, but you are delegating certain tasks and choosing to see that as a gift for the other person who gains the experience and the wisdom of, of taking on this very important task and knowing that you're trusting that person with it. Marianne, yeah. let's pull you in here. How do you think of competing demands? Well, if I may, I mean, I'll, I'll, I will answer that, but I, I guess I wanted to note one thing because when I had a really amazing global team, it was very, very international working on this inventory. And I really debated with Wendy in, in particular, we were both like, are you sure we need the first section on experiencing tensions? Because we were, our comment was, doesn't everybody? And I just want to say this is if other people have filled this out and had much lower sco scores there, we realized in a lot of research that people vary widely, widely in how much they experience them, really for two, two reasons. And I think it goes to your question, Holly. I mean, so the first is sensitivity. Like I see these in my sleep. I literally see them everywhere, tensions, in part because I'm looking for them and I see value in them. So I'm, in, by the way, if they're not there, I go, I go look harder. And I've had great leaders say the same thing is if you don't see them, we don't have the right thing, people around the table. We don't have the right issues on the table. But the second one is, is so, you know, one is just that we're sensitized to it. And the other can be conditions. I mean, I, I just heard Mary and Kelly both say, you know, there are different parts of their career that maybe it didn't quite feel so tenuous. But the more we get comfortable taking those next steps and getting more plates spinning, the more we're going to feel the more tensions we will experience. And so I think it's both. It's that we're sensitive and the conditions that we put ourselves in. And we actually see a very wide range in this compete in the first section of experiencing paradox. The other piece, I just as an odd note, one of the reasons we immediately made it international, we had so many different languages, is we really thought there'd be a difference between Eastern and Western cultures. Because so much of the work of paradox starts with Taoism and Buddhism and right ancient, and we didn't find them. We did not yeah. find them. In fact, we were talking with the Japanese people partners the other day about this, and they said, "No, they're not surprised about that at all." Right? Th these are individual. They're not as cultural as we would have expected. Um, but I mean, the way I, I, I see competing demands because I see them in my sleep, I, I kind of see them at different levels. There's the competing demands of in leadership, right? That you feel because of the work that you're doing, strategy and uh, strategy and uh, tactical, um, different stakeholders, right? I've heard a lot of you say say those pieces, but then I, I mean, I'll get really philosophical. I, I love listening to some some of the the Buddhist meditation kind of pieces, and and if you get into those, I mean, I think life is existentially paradoxical. 
I think life and death, love and hate. I mean, the more you get into it, the more you realize, oh, this is just the nature of humans, existence. And to me, when I because I, I will lean into some of those things, it actually makes me more comfortable with them, makes me more accepting that, of course it is, right? The more you lean into life, the more potential for death. But the more you lean into death, the more you take away your opportunities for life. Brene Brown is just, as an example, which is one of my favorite people. And the whole paradoxical kind of interplay between vulnerability and courage is just a very powerful concept. And once kind of that aha comes on, I that's what I love about work like she's done, where you say, oh my gosh, I get it. You're right. You can't be brave if you're not in the arena, right? And you can't be vulnerable without getting in the arena, right? I mean, it, it, like it, it, they work together, this yin yang, and they feed each other. So I, I love that. And I will give you far too many books to read, but there's what I like is seeing increasingly the number of places that we hear this kind of thinking. Wendy and I just, this is a humble brag, but we just won the, the Breakthrough Thinkers Award for Thinkers 50, which makes me laugh because it is a literally a thousands and thousands of year old concept. It's just maybe either uh, an idea whose time has come, right? Maybe, or that there's enough work going on that we can better articulate it. But I, I appreciate that you can feel it resonating because uh, I, I do see these everywhere. Thank you. And I love that you brought up Renee. She's one of my longtime favorites and her book, Dare to Lead is a wonderful one. Um, and she was just on um, Adam Grant's Rethinking podcast. And another uh, favorite. Yeah, she yeah, was, and it was actually an old one. That, Wendy, so yeah, he re, he replayed that one recently, and it was like it, you know, bringing down the archives and replaying the classic. And I think he brought it back because this is a concept that so many more people are continually paying attention to. So let's move down to the second section. We've talked a lot about this idea of experiencing tensions, but it sounds, Marianne, like one of your favorite sections is this paradox mindset. So can we dig in a little bit more? I want to look at number nine. I'm comfortable dealing with conflicting demands. Um, is that the right one there? But yes. I, okay, so the conflicting demand. So it's not just this idea of having a lot of things going on, but it's the idea of like the head to head, which one of these do I choose? So Kelly, can you kick us off here at this idea of how to hold those two together and specifically working through the paradox mindset aspect of it. Yeah, thanks so much, Holly. You know, again, I'm gonna go back to the creativity and the curiosity and the thinking piece. If you, you know, we are all born geniuses, right? Until we're five. And we can see by the national and international scores of creativity and the genius level that unfortunately from five forward, our creativity starts going down until we actually get retirement age. And then our creativity and our, our advent to play and solve, problem solve goes significantly up. Um, so with that being said, this idea of the conflicting, you know, tensions and demands, you have to be creative to be able to solve these things. You've got to use your ingenuity. You've got to use your intuition. You have to use your empathy. You have to be able to deal with this internally and externally. And obviously as an entrepreneur, you know, and Mary, especially, and I obviously I hear now also Marianne as a dean, any of us, how are you in a leadership position? You're always looking out the window when you're driving the car and there's a lot coming in the, the front window. And are you going to drive it? My dad always told me, like, if you drive a car looking down in front of you, you're going to crash. But if you drive a car looking on the horizon, and you know where you're going, you will never crash. So that's why it's always look up and look ahead and not look down and get stuck because you will crash. And so for me, anytime I have those tensions, I know I need to constantly look up, what's the vision? Where are we headed? What matters most? And sometimes, you know, it's hard because you've said, I'm, I'm feeling this to my solar plexus. I mean, I'm, I'm having, you know, palpitations. I'm, I'm breathing, having a panic attack. I mean, I remember when the first time when I was touring Children's Hospital, when they invited me for my first project there, I was like, there's no way I'm doing this job. Like I'm literally having a panic attack there. I had to actually go into a restroom and breathe because I felt so uncomfortable because I had had a very traumatic experience there with my newborn 
you know, 25 years, 27 years ago now when they saved their life the first time. And when they asked me to go work there, I was like, I can't do this job. I, I just physically and mentally and emotionally can't do it. But by having that experience, again, I immediately felt that conflict, wait a minute, this tells me this may be as well I should be. Rethink, you know, your pain. If you're having that kind of a reaction, it's like, wait a minute, woo, that's telling me something. So really rely on your heart. You know, your head will always do a lot of great work for you. You know, it will always, you can read another book, you can talk to another coach, you can have another mentor, you can go back to college, you know, or we can just, you know, listen in on, you know, Marianne's and on Holly's, you know, podcasts and books forward. But at the end of the day, you've got to really be responsible for your own heart. And when you put your head on your pillow at the end of the night, you know, did you do a good job today? Did you do the right thing? Did you choose the right path? You know, and so for me, it's always, I always go back to being heart centered. I love this idea of pull up and relook at the vision. And Mary, you brought that up that you do that every quarter. So that's one of the tools you're using. But any other tools that come to mind for you, Mary, and things that stand out to you that have helped you succeed with this idea of dealing with conflicting demands and the continuation of paradox? For me, I've, <laughs> I've always moved too fast. And I can tell that from results, you know? So when I learned to slow down and listen to that old, was it Simon? No, it was the bird, slow down, you move too fast. You got to make this morning last. That became a mantra in my head to be able to realize for me to decompress and take that time in. But I always, I make a list of all the ideas and thoughts of what I have to get done every morning during my, after my quiet time. And then I choose the top three, that if the day was over, what are the three most important things? And if anything else that gets done is bonus. So I've learned to give myself grace and mercy and to give others grace and mercy also. I was raised by a man who I loved very dearly, my father, but he was a very impatient man. And that seeing that I knew I wanted to find a different way to deal with that, especially when I start seeing and feeling myself responding the same way, that's not the way I wanted to be. And I know enough about our psyche that what we focus on is what we attract in our life. So I wanted to focus on what I wanted, not on what I don't want. Because I surely would get, I had that the first 30 years of my life. I got all the things I didn't want. So I start focusing on what I did want and how is this going to result? And, it, you know, I said earlier, you know, if you put the different ideas on sticky notes, it, it makes it a tangible. And if you put your fears when you're in the middle of a paradox and not sure, and you put them on sticky notes on a wall and you can look at them and they become tangibles, it reduces the emotion connected to them and you can move them around and up and down and even tear some up if you want to, because our imagination will always make it extreme to be able to do that. So giving myself permission to do that and giving myself permission. And I've not found how to teach my adult children this yet. You don't have to have all the answers when somebody asks a question. You can put a pause on that. I think that creates a lot of paradox and tension in all of our lives, whether it's with your kids, your family, your work, your customers. We try to show that we're smarter than anybody because that's how we create value. But when we create value most is when we can give them what they need, not necessarily what they want. And sometimes as you know, I need to think about that for a minute, or I need to, I don't know enough about that to, to be able to have a response as yet, but I can get back to you. And that has helped me a lot with reducing the tension, accepting the paradoxes. They exist in tensions, but to be able to take a little breathing space and be able to think it through and not have to react right away. What I have found is the times in my life that I tried to make something the way I thought it should be is when it imploded the biggest, <laughs> it caused the biggest explosion. When I allowed myself to look at real options and make real choices, then things start working better. Like the when we were fired by the consultant, 
We were hiring 50 people a month back then. 50 people, and we were still 30 people short. And we were doing drug tests and background checks and training. So it was expensive. Within the first 90 days, we reduced that. To, our turnover went from 400% to 100% when we start overcoming other obstacles. And that's how we did it. We looked at our, our employees' obstacles. Why? What would they need that we could help them overcome? to improve their quality of life because they don't even know to look at paradoxes and tensions. They just know they're in survival mode. We thought we were in survival mode until we looked at what the, their life quality of life was. So there's always these different levels of it. And it made a huge difference. And Tony just said, let's hire 70 people a month. I mean, he just got, got to come and answer. I'm like, whoa, no. It was the first time I said no to <laughs> working with them. You know, like, he did. He has said a couple of times, I started this business. I said, and where would it be without me? <laughs> it's together that we make yeah. amazing things happen. And that helps dealing with paradoxes and tensions is having a partner and business team members that you can have this conversation. And that's one of the smartest things Christy and Clint did as the CEO, COO, and Ron, the president, is they built a, an advisory, the advisors of JANCOA, of team leaders, of HR, project management, night operations, and that so that they have everybody's part of the conversation. So when there's paradox, it's not just them making the decision. Because for 30 years, it was basically Tony and I making the decision. So they build an interior board to be able to that know all the details in that. So it, it does make a difference when we take that opportunity and bring others in and make it a tangible and not just an abstract emotion that we feel like we have to react to like that. I love the, you know, sticky notes as a tangible item and just taking that quiet time to breathe. I love that you highlighted that you have morning quiet time. The running joke in my family is everyone knows when mommy had her yoga morning and everyone <laughs> That's true. So it does not do me any good to sleep in if it means that I miss that 20 minutes of Holly time. And, and we have to recognize that. Uh, you also shared a lot about this idea of slowing down. And I remember uh, through some of past trainings, I've learned this, the concept of slow is smooth, smooth is fast. So if you're just kind of running all over the place, that's a lot of wasted energy. So figure out that slow is smooth, smooth is fast and focusing on those three things. So really amazing key takeaways there um, that we can all apply no matter what the concept is today. So Marianne, I want to look here at number 12 on the list. I enjoy it when I manage to pursue contradictory goals. And I think the operative word here is manage. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, yes, I did it. Um, so why is focusing on management of these tensions important? I thought you were going to say the key word in that line was enjoy. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's probably both, right? I, um, I've heard different people say it in different ways, but I, I can't say it enough. You will never resolve, like fix this. And so by realizing what you're doing is taking the next step, you're, which is a management approach. It's not a control approach. It's not an eliminating, resolving approach. It, it, the idea and a lot of these questions that you can see, you can see the way you think and the way you feel about them kind of coming out. But the management idea is what's next, right? And how do you move forward? How do you look to that horizon? We call it tightrope walking and start to move forward it doesn't have to be perfect. It can't be perfect. And it will not make it go away forever. It will come up again. But that's really our push there is to help people start to get, see that you can actually find energy, positive energy in these tensions. And that's a big change, enjoyment, energy. You can see that in some of these questions. Then that kind of defense, defensive mode that we can get into, which pushes us into either or thinking and can be really quite destructive in these because either or thinking really pushes us typically toward an extreme. And we start, tend to over correct in, toward a particular side. If you think about any of the big tensions in your life, at some level, you need them both. You may not be able to do them both today, but you need to have keep moving forward along multiple dimensions. 
And that's part of the, the management idea there, Holly. So Marianne, I think that is a perfect segue into a couple of questions that we've received here. Um, we have one coming in from the audience uh, sharing that in observing our current political system and algorithms in media and social media, it seems they are actively driving our society toward black and white thinking or either or thinking and not acknowledging nuance or seeking out different perspectives, tensions, paradox. How do we bring these concepts beyond an individual level to reckon with more as a community? Oh, it's a huge question. I, I was sharing- I know, you're like, I got all oh, the no, answers. That's a great right one. Here. It's phenomenal. <laughs> well, and actually I was sharing before we, we started this that my co-author was just here and we were talking about the next next step. And in many ways, it's what you just said, Holly, and it's a great question because, I mean, I'll, I'll go in one one particular area, right? If you you think about, I don't think this is, this is in a lot of ways, but if you think about kind of the way AI and social media works, it actually intensifies and narrows what you're seeing over time, which makes it increasingly black and white. And that you're seeing by being uh, it more over time, more extreme and more narrow, you're actually in a smaller circle of ideas. It The big push then is to get out of your rabbit hole, you have to look elsewhere. You have to purposefully push yourself. Like I'll give you a crazy one, but I do this every day, probably gonna make me crazy, literally at some point, where I flip in my car between the BBC, CNN and Fox News and now I've just added Politico and C-SPAN. And the reason I do that is it, it is like the blind men and the elephant parable. They are all talking about the same thing and it is shocking and eye-opening how different their lenses are. And the point isn't right or wrong. The point is these are incredibly complicated situations. And we would, that's an Adam Grant kind of thing again. How do you lean into the complexity and the nuances and take a deep breath and say, there's not an obvious right, wrong, they, we, right? Because it is more gray than that. It doesn't mean moral relativism, moral relativism. We all have to take our stances, but how do we make sure we're always questioning where is our stance? And are we actually listening, engaging with enough variety that we know? Or, and 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 by no, I mean kind of the paradox of knowledge. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. Do exercises like this and it will open your mind. It will in really important ways. And I and I really I pray every day for our world that we can all push for more of that because we need to actually reach out and understand. So thank you very much. Uh there's an oh Kelly, go on. Yeah, I just wanted to build on that because first of all, Kate, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think we as leaders in our families and our communities, and our universities, and our companies, we have a job to do as leaders to continue to open the thinking and keep the thinking open. So it's about having white space, whether you're using sticky, stick, you know, creativity again, you're using stickies to create, co-create, dispose of things that are temporary, focus on what matters. Um, but, you know, she asked specifically, you know, what can we do? So love the concept of broadening the thinking and continuing to keep all of your channels or your media channels open for your listening. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I'm working really hard on right now that I was really humbled by was realizing that I'm only the power of one in this world today. And I only have one vote in some cases. And so I decided that as a legacy for myself, I'm working on an event for America's 250th celebration coming up in 2026. It's called America's with the Roots. And I, why, why I wanted to work on that from a creative standpoint is I wanted to create a community dialogue around what is the role um, that Cincinnati has played in our freedom and a focus of where we're headed. And so if you can, in your own world, whether it's within your family, at the dining room table, or it's within the community that you work within or the circles that you work within, having community dialogue, bringing people together to have that dialogue, that's that multi-perspective thinking that gets us out of the silo thinking. And so creating an event, creating an activity, creating a community living room 
through an experience that people can engage in dialogue and leave thinking differently, I think that is the opportunity for all of us. And so for me, I'm just really focused on any opportunity I can create for my team to keep them creatively thinking and keeping them energized and putting them in the right places at the right time to be thinking about opportunities and growing from each other, um, simply down to even just having a community break room where we break bread together and you know discuss things like this book, which is amazing. Um, you know, or you're working on a larger, more signature type of event, you know, looking ahead and trying to create opportunities for dialogue. I think we all have a responsibility. So Kate, thank you for that question. And I know what a leader you are. And you know, I think we, if we all can like, have responsibility to keep those channels open. It's a way that we can definitely further humanity for the better. I love that. And I love that note of positivity, Kelly. So very true. I know we are running short on time. We have a couple of um, quick questions here that we'll wrap up with. We have a question on where we can find Marianne's book. And another question about any other resources that uh, you would recommend for the audience on the topics of vulnerability, failure, tension, understanding of self as um, as we move forward. So any other resources that folks would recommend? I'll throw out a, a few more that I, I, and I just put a, a couple of, of short resources, both on thinking.net. We've got all of our podcasts, all of the articles that have come out, all, other ways to get the book. So thank you. Um, one of the things that I've become increasingly focused on is polarization as one challenge. and. I would just encourage you, if you're interested in exploring more, to look at Arthur Brooks. I think he is brilliant. I'm a huge um, believer in his work, both on love your enemy and strength to strength, both really insightful. I would also add um, Ezra Klein, uh, why we're polarized. Um, I just, I, I and uh, Jonathan Haidt's uh, Righteous Mind. I mean, they're all coming out why we tend to go toward extremes and away from openness uh, with different kind of lenses. But um, I think there's a lot of really important work being done. And I love, Kelly, the work that you're doing. I, this whole conversation to me has been really enlightening. And I, I so appreciate that. Well, this has been such a beautiful conversation and you all have jazzed me up to keep doing the good work. I would like to thank Bartlett's We Invest Initiative, Women Empowered to Invest, for hosting today's webinar and for inviting Mary Ann, Mary and Kelly to come together to share their perspectives. I, When I think about investing. I mean, obviously, I'm a wealth advisor, so top of mind comes to the financial wealth, but that is not the only important part of investing. It's about investing in yourself. It's about investing in your community. It's about investing in each other, in your career, in our thinking, in your legacy, and just so many different aspects, so many different pillars and ways to continue to improve this conversation. So I very much look forward to engaging with all of you. Uh, we welcome your feedback. Please do reach out to us. And we look forward to hosting you for many more We Invest events to come and to continue to engage in these topics of purpose uh, as we head into 2024. Thank you all so much for joining us here today, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care. Thank you.